I think so. I don't want to drag it out too much. So, yep. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Mitch. Ko Ruapeu Te Moana, Ko Manawatu Te Awa, Ko Te Tini Te Waka, Ko Te Papaya Oia Te Wahi Eru Nei Taku Naku, E Noho Ene Ki Natia E Naere, Toko Whana Tangata E Roto I Toko Whano, Ki Kai Mahi Ki Sport Wakato E Tine Wako U Cooksley Toko E Noa. Kia ora. Bill Cooksley from Sport Waikato, originally from the mighty Manawatu. Okay, <laughs> 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 calm down. Uh, from now, I reside just outside of Natia in the wonderful Haraki Plains. Um, and it's good for cycling out there because there's no hills. <laughs> Unlike these bike Mercury Bay people. Great to see some um, familiar faces and some people that I don't know that I'd love to have a connection with or a relationship in the, in the very near future, particularly as we move forward to this Tracks and Trails Forum. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about Sport Waikato and our vision, and recently we've been through a massive change. Um, so we've still got that, this vision of everyone being out there and active, and that's through play, active recreation and sport. And that's kind of the mantra that we're looking after at the moment. And so why we exist? is to increase the physical activity levels of people in the Waikato region through those play, active recreation and sport uh, uh, ways. And how we do this is by providing now high value strategic regional leadership in those three areas. What does it actually look like on the ground? Um, so we're, as I said, a strategic collaborative approach and a partnered approach throughout the whole region to influence the play, active recreation and sports system. It's not us doing the delivery anymore. We used to do a lot of delivery. We've worked, walked away from that. We're now into communities helping themselves. Community driven, it's been mentioned before. Okay, so we're helping and advocate support and influence those that are doing the delivery of which there are a number of you in this room that do that. And we're guided by our strategy, which is called Moving Waikato. Right, and I can put this, I'll send this uh, presentation I've done through to Mitch and he can forward it on to all the invitees, all the people here, and um, we'll put that link in there so you can have a look through that. We've particularly got to focus on our tamariki and rangatahi, so that zero to 18 years age group. We understand that there are other age groups, obviously that... Uh, also need to build, we provide support and advocacy and some regional leadership around that, but that's our real focus for us at this moment. We're increasing the quality of experience in the play, active recreation and sport area. We're building capability, as mentioned before, helping communities to help themselves. Really driven by insights and data and research to help and advocate groups make uh, informed decisions, particularly when it comes to funding um, or uh, building or for spaces and places. And as I mentioned before, working in partnership and collaboration. Specifically though, my role is as a regional connectivity coordinator and I work across three districts, so that's uh, Thames Coromandel, Hauraki and the Matamata Piako districts. Um, and my role is to support the play, active recreation, the sports strategy formation, implementation, as well as review. So an example of recent work that I've done in this area was the uh, development and also the adoption and uh, presenting to council the recently adopted June 2020 sport active recreation uh, plan for Thames Coromandel District. And if you're not aware of that, Come and see me afterwards, um, or there's a link on the TCDC website for you to have a look at that as well. Uh, other part of my role, advocacy for opportunities that address inequities and increase participation, particularly for those that aren't currently participating. How do we make it easier for people to do stuff that they want to do? I would suggest that in this room, majority if not all of you are already doing some form of regular physical activity or recreation throughout your week. 
So I'm preaching to the converted a little bit, but it's the other people that are in your communities, how can we make it easier for them to do stuff so we can increase their activity and their participation levels. Um, regionally, there's four connector roles and um, we've also got what's called a play advocate in our role in our team as well. And he's working specifically with Hamilton City Council within that play space. So that's a little bit about me and my job. Um, but before I go any further, I just also want to thank you for what you do. There are a number, I should imagine, thousands of volunteer hours currently sitting in this room, okay, that you just go and you do your stuff, but from a region perspective and a Sport Waikato perspective, thank you very much for the time and effort that you put into what you do on a volunteer basis. You might be here as part of your role, as part of your job, but I'm sure that you do volunteer stuff out and about um, in the community as well, so thank you for that. And thanks so much for putting me on after lunch as well. Um, I think this is a fantastic opportunity to get everyone together. And uh, we also do need to be mindful that it's not just a talk fest, that there are some actions that come out of us. Okay, and I think Mitch is going to workshop that afterwards. So that's really cool. So I've been asked today to come along and share some um, concepts and examples with regards to providers collaborating. And that's really in and around, a, a, I suppose, a hubbing concept and working closer together to achieve a common goal. You look at this map up here, it's a fantastic opportunity to get all the different groups together. Thames Mountain Bike Club is one, you know, Fong Mata Ridges Mountain Bike Club is another, Bike Mercury Bay, even the Hauraki Handlebars which I'm a, I'm a part of in the Hauraki District. Coromandel, ride Coromandel, to get together with a shared vision on how can we make this better. Rather than operating in silos, how can we all join forces and actually advocate from a collective voice so that we can get some action done. So I'm going to provide a couple of examples on some hubbing concepts that have happened or are happening currently. As we are very much aware, the problem is that participation numbers throughout, I suppose, organised sport and throughout physical activity tends to be dropping. There's plenty of research, it's not just happening in our district, it's happening right throughout the country. And there's actually uh, more of a push towards recreational type activities when it's in our own time. It's low cost, some pay for play type scenarios, so the traditional membership, for want of a better word, tends to be dropping. So how can we leverage that opportunity in terms of offering better recreational type activities? Any questions so far? No, no, it's not a problem. No, it's not a problem, Felicity, and that's a really good point. Okay, I guess the, the problem is just highlighting that, um, that our traditional thinking around oh, having a winter code as such and then a summer code, we need to change our thinking a little bit around that. So, are activity levels dropping? Or is it just the participation of all nice schools dropping? Physical activity levels throughout the Waikato region have remained stagnant since 2004. You're talking about age group or? Right across the board. 54% of the Waikato region's people were physically active enough for uh, health benefits in 2004. 2014 it was 46. 2017 18 it was back to 54%. So it's trying to target those others. All right, um, so sometimes it's harder to pitch, uh, hard to picture what the future holds, but what we do know is the sport and recreation sector is changing. Well, it needs to move with the swift changes that have been happening in our society. Okay? Pre-COVID though, interesting that within Thames Coromandel District, um, where are we? 
so even, be even before that pandemic, biking events are rated in the top five events in the Thames Coromandel District, and that's through Active New Zealand survey data. Okay, so biking events, all right, and walking is one of the top activities throughout the Coromandel District. So how do we leverage that opportunity further? And there's our participation profiles that we have available that, um, once again, I'll send the link through Mitch for you to, uh, people can have a look at those participation profiles that we've done for all of the districts throughout the Waikato region. So we talk about this hubbing concept, um, and there's an increasing number of examples, uh, with some good evidence of many benefits when combining their resources, and I guess that's the, the angle that we're looking at tomorrow, uh, today, because we've got these different groups throughout the Coromandel Peninsula, how do we start thinking more collectively together to achieve this common goal of potentially a trail, I'm just surmising here, a trail that starts in Thames and goes right across the Coromandel Peninsula, ends, ends in Coromandel or ends in Fidianga, and then you can ride it back. So a massive loop that goes around as a, a track and trail. So um, here I've got a little video, it's about 10 minutes long, okay. Um, whilst it is sports specifically based and based around their venue, it'll hopefully give you an idea in terms of the concept and how they went through that process. Sorry guys, I'm trying to work all this stuff out before the day. Uh, very, very some technical issues. Okay, I'll send you the link for that. <laughs> 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 
So, so that was a really cool 10 minute video. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just, I just made it up. Sorry about that team. Was it, was it from Manila too? <laughs> Okay, but the, uh, the video that you didn't see was, um, was about the Argyle Sports Ball. So they were a, uh, a group of sports clubs that were all over this place on a, on a, on a, on a site in Dargaville, all operating in their own little silos. And they recognised the opportunity to, to get together so how they could, one, um, increase their volunteer base, work collectively through a board and governance structure in terms of a trust, and then um, increase their, uh, their, their facilities, improve their facilities through that collective effort. So um, when, you get the, when you get the link, um, there, there, I promise there was a video on there, and you can, you can have a look at it anyway. The other one I wanted to uh, give you an example of was the Hauraki Plains Community Hub. Now, this was only established in September 2020, where that is a uh, governance board of eight members. Um, four were appointed through a process that was facilitated by a, a consultancy company uh, alongside Sport Waikato and a working group that got together. And uh, so there were four appointed uh, board members, skills based, not necessarily from representatives of the founding member clubs. Because uh, there are cases and some case studies, examples throughout the country where if you have a, 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 a governance board that are rep have representatives from each club, then it's a little bit too much of a narrow focus. Okay, so four of the board members are skills based and appointed, three were elected on through nominations through the founding member groups, of which there are 17. And uh, the board has the ability to co-opt up to two other members on the board for special projects, as such, for a period of 12 months. Okay, um, the Hauraki Plains Community Hub, whilst it kind of morphed out of what was called the Nazi Domain Users Group, it actually, um, the member groups it's actually wider than that. So we've got uh, a, a clubs like Kirapai Bowls Club, um, Hauraki Golf Club, which is out at Mangaterrata, so you're talking, you know, 10, 12 k's away, Hauraki North Rugby Club. Uh, so it's not specifically venue-based, it's more about the area and how the board can help to um, help these clubs and these organisations so they're provider groups as well, not specifically incorporated clubs as such. Um, remain uh, sustainable, build up their capability, build up their succession plan, and ultimately increase their participation and their membership of their groups, whether that's financial membership that they have or not. Okay. Um, we are, I'm, I'm a member on that board and we are very early in our journey still so we're still finding our feet a little bit we're just in the process of adopting our own strategic plan first and foremost to ensure that we have some clear guidance on what it is that we want to achieve and we want to help our clubs achieve now interestingly those clubs they do not amalgamate they do not lose their own identity they do not lo lose their own committee structures or their own financial structures. Okay, what they do is they just become, through a memorandum of understanding, they become uh, a founding member of the hub. The hub's benefits in the long run are to ultimately take a lot of that stress and I suppose a lot of that administration and that work and that volunteer work required off of those committees to um, help them purely concentrate on delivering their sport or their activity. So that's just an example of what can be done. Okay, and I think you're going to potentially workshop anything around that um, coming up. Well, is there like a 
toolkit that is used? Will it help? Or? Yeah. Now, this is, thank you, Ali. Really good segue. Great. This is uh, within the past two weeks, the Sport New Zealand online hub guide has been launched. All right, so um, I'll put that link in there as well, Mitch. So you go to Sport New Zealand websites, sportnz.org, and um, you go in there, it's on, the, on their front page now, hub guide. And you can register in and then you can start stepping through the process. Funnily enough, well, I shouldn't say funnily enough, but uh, I suppose a point of note to note is that throughout that hub guide, any facility or, or asset solution is actually step seven out of seven. A lot of organisations or groups that get together go, right, we need to build this and hope they come. But I suppose a lot of examples are that you get your process, your governance and you concentrate on your people first, then the asset solution will take care of itself further on down the track. And is there a cost to this? Or is the hub guide? Yeah. Nope. They, and how that works, Ali, is you can go and you can set up a project and then you can invite members into it, all right, or people, organisations into it, and they can comment and put questions in and it's all kind of on that stage on there. All good? Okay. Any questions? You can clap now. Thanks, Ali. Thank Sorry about the technical issues. Oh, we always like to talk about Any questions? Have you done any influencing of councils around promoting activity? So councils are often here to be a documentation that they want to encourage recreation, but when push comes to shove, they're more interested in trees and vegetation as opposed to us doing. <laughs> Yep. G'day, I feel a bit fraudulent being here. Um, when I started out playing with tracks and dirt and, and what have you, I never expected I'd be presented to a group. And, and what an impressive group, and the numbers of nothing else. Um, when we had meetings in Wellington, we'd, we'd struggle to get half the number of people that are here today. So congratulations to you for being here and, and coming along and showing interest. I thought I'd start with a little bit of history as to why I got into tracks and how that evolved, and then maybe do the high, the how, the what, the why, um, and the who of, of track building. Um, I, you know, I don't particularly want to talk for a whole hour at you. If you've got something that's of real interest to you, you want to ask questions, then just fire them out. Um, hopefully, I know the answer. If I don't, I'll be honest and say that I've got no idea. Uh, I'm kind of standing on the shoulders of others. Uh, there's a lot of people that have gone before us and have stolen their ideas, so that's why I sort of feel a little bit fraudulent about being here today. Uh, how did I get involved? Today I still ride with the same bunch of friends uh, that we started in 1991, riding local tracks around the Wellington Town Belt. Um, and when the weather was lousy, we'd do a bit of track maintenance. Uh, purely for self-interest, so we could uh, indulge ourselves in, in trails and in the environment. That's changed. Now I'm really, really passionate about getting people off their asses and out into the environment. So it doesn't matter what base you're coming from, you can still change and morph to get people out into the environment. And it doesn't matter what user group you're representing, um, if you're getting people out into the environment and providing that access for people to recreate or but in Wellington it's commuting as well, then good on you. So um, maybe a little bit more about the history. So we, we started off doing that maintenance thing, which is really uh, trees would fall over in storms, we'd have two tracks that didn't quite connect and we'd do something about that and connect the two up. Um, and over time, Things changed in Wellington, so there were no no controls. We could do whatever we wanted. There was no one from the council saying you can do this. These are the policies, and uh, you have to adhere to rules because they just didn't exist. So we got out and we just played in the dirt and had no idea what we were doing. 
we, uh, the tools we got came from garage sales. Um, we had no idea what a clinometer was. Um, we had no idea how to build a track, and we built some terrible tracks. Um, absolutely awful. So you, it, it doesn't, what I'm trying to sort of get across is it doesn't matter where you start, um, it's not a bad thing. Um, although I will say, it's really easy to build a track, it's really hard to build a good track. And that's through a trial and error process about how the bike or the run or the walker can, can use the track to, to their best advantage. Um, I'm going to confine my comments to grade three tracks. Now, um, there's, there's plenty of stuff out there on the web about what makes a grade one, two, three, four, five trails. Um, for volunteers, and I'm absolutely a volunteer, I've not been paid a dollar for anything uh, with my involvement in tracks over the years. Um, being a volunteer, you're pretty well constrained to grade three, four, and five. The grade ones and twos are your wide, very easy tracks, and typically you're using earth moving equipment to create those because of their width. So a grade three track, you're um, limited pretty much to the width of a, a grubber, which is our weapon of choice. Um, the gradient is around five degrees average, and the turning radius of a hairpin is about two meters, two and a half meters. So that's kind of the thing that I'm going to, to limit myself to. Um, the, the land that we've been working on has all been council owned. So, uh, if you don't have the consent of the landowner, you've got nothing to work with. You have to have a relationship with the landowner to be able to um, create a track. So, and I'll come back to how, how that consent and process works and how we've evolved through um, the council having a hands-off approach and having very much a, a hands-on approach in Wellington. So if, if you don't have land, you've got nothing. So you really need to have an idea. So where does that idea come from? Um, maybe you had a bender at the pub and you woke up the following morning and decided, look, I, I can't live my life like this. I have to go out and give back to society and create a community asset and you decide, well, I want to go and build a track. So, if you want to do that, you need to have an idea of where you want to build a track. Um, and then, the tools. The best way to, to mark a track is really just some, some flagging tape. I don't know if you've seen this. It's, it's incredibly handy for, for marking a trail. Uh, I'm, a, I'm very passionate about master planning um, and it's one of my failures. So you've got a chunk of land. It's going to have a boundary either by separate ownership or some other physical constraint, valleys, ridges, um, streams or whatever. Uh, a, a trail by, hopefully by its nature, will take you somewhere and hopefully it will follow an interesting path. You want to go through points of interest um, and quite often that has a view um, or it's a, it's a lovely valley and you want to make, or it could have some sort of historical context or cultural context. So these all sort of come into play around where you will take a track. Um, the council in Wellington is particularly interested in connections. So it needs to take you from somewhere to somewhere else. And if you can create a route that goes somewhere of interest, so much the better. Um, because you want to you wanna have something that's of value to your trail users, be them walkers, runners, um, or cyclists. Um, and there is an interplay between those different groups. Some good, some bad. Um, in Wellington, we have a lot of bitchiness going on with dog walkers at present. Um, before the dog, work, dog walkers were the scourge, the mountain bikers were the scourge. Um, so it, it does change over time, 
and I've, I've got every confidence that the e-bike is going to be the scourge of the future. Uh, so, yeah, you, you sort of have to roll with it. There's going to be people coming in and out of fa favour uh, or flavour um, along the along the way. So. My attitude is, look, embrace everyone that's in a non-motorised, you know, okay, e-bikes are motorised or not, whatever. Um, they're out there enjoying nature, and that's what really the, the essence of what we're trying to encourage, is getting people out there and having a, having a blast and enjoying nature. Um, there are so many podcasts you can listen to around exercise being good for um, longevity and all of those other things. And... Um, I, I, I don't think there is any issue with councils encouraging people to get out there amongst it. There is a caveat though because in the user group that we deal with in Wellington, there are the hands-off group that don't want any development whatsoever. So the, the, I guess the learning there is there is no way you will ever please everybody all of the time. Um, and that's a truism. And, and that's where the council or the regulatory authority need to step up and uh, sometimes they've got to make the hard decision and um, make a call. Are you, are you going to appeal to the small group that don't want anything or are you going to appeal to hopefully the larger group that want to get access into the green spaces and get, a, get out there and enjoy it? So that is a a challenge, and, and I, I, was, I was sort of mentioning that to, to, um, to Mitch last night around the role of councils. So, uh, so Andy, can you just help everybody understand that all of the land that you guys put your trails on is council land? Yep. yep. So we are at the um, the town belt and the outer green belt in Wellington. Um, it's all controlled either by the um, the deed of the, the town belt or by the Reserves Act. So there is quite a bit of legislation and um, uh, council documents. They have the uh, town belt management plan, the outer green belt management plan, the open spaces access plan. Uh, so yeah, the barriers are greater if you're starting now in Wellington than they used to be. Um, and it, 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 it's a challenge to get your head across all of that documentation and which document applies to what you're doing. Um, and just out of interest, we're going through a, a process now of um, getting approval for maybe 50 kilometres more track in the outer green belt in Wellington. Um, our group personally, uh, Brooklyn Trail Builders, has built about 18 kilometres of track, all hand built. Um, so we're trying to step it up, and I'm looking at that 50k of track is my retirement job, unpaid. Um, so hopefully that that will come to fruition and we'll be able to get stuck into that, that new stuff. Um, I'm just trying to think where I got to before you asked the question. So I guess it was um, that relationship with council and, and working with them and how that's changed over time. Yeah. So originally the council were hands off, now they're pretty much hands on. Um, and, and I can't say why why that is. Um, maybe they've figured out that we're actually producing quite a good product and they want part of the action or not, I don't know. Uh, the, it, it, it should be a match made in heaven. The councils are really constrained now financially. You've got a volunteer group that are happy to create a product at no cost to the council you would think that would be a perfect solution for, for everybody, it's not. Because, because you have members of society who do whatever they do and you have people that break laws, you have people that object, you have people that don't want change. Um, and that becomes challenging. So the, the, the council can get one complaint and the council will have to respond to that complaint and an inordinate amount of effort goes into responding to that one complaint. By way of example, someone complained about the use of Waratahs in the town belt. We can no longer use Waratahs in any of our construction. And it's a, it's a pain. A, a Waratah is a, 
is a fantastic tool for driving into rocky ground to retain wood to support a track edge. And we can't use that anymore because of one complaint. Um, the, the only risks I saw with Waratahs is they rust over time, now they can't be organised, so go figure. Um, what was the nature of the complaint? Just they just that? thought it was inappropriate that a Waratah... Yeah, they, uh, you know, you, uh, it, it could be because of the exposed end, yeah. but we always put a, a cap of wood yeah. over top um, and nail that into the retaining material, so there was never a risk of, of ripping the skin. Um, and that was a better way than, than putting the, the yellow things, which are just visually awful, um, and I hate that. So um, I assume that that gives me a complaint as now volunteer. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those curious things where you get this weird response by council and, and they don't recognise all of the good that we do. And, and I would like to think that that's just not a biased view because, um, yeah, we're on Facebook and we get a lot of feedback through Facebook. The, to me, the best feedback is when I'm out there on the tracks and people stop and talk to you, um, which is a real pain when I want to be working on the tracks and you've got to stop and, and, and chat and try and be polite. Um, I have to get better at that and I'm not very good at it, so um, there's a learning there for me. So, uh, the, the whole thing with um, dealing with councils is fraught. You just have to front foot it and, and do the best you can. Um, build relationships with the, the officers um, and, if you can, with the elected officials. So, over the years, <coughs> rightly or wrongly, I've got to know the mayors of, of Wellington. And the current incumbent mayor is, is well known. He showed up when he was a councillor working away uh, and then joined us on, on working bees. And he's a, an active runner. He's a terrible rider. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> That's Andy, Andy Foster. Uh, but the, dealing with the council is really, really important, or whoever the, the landowner is. If you've got a private landowner, fantastic, grab them with both hands. It will be so much easier than dealing with a, a regulatory body that is bound by a lot of rules through the consultation process. Um, and, and all I can say is just hang in there and just keep at it, uh, keep ringing them up, phoning them, meeting them on site, letting them know what you want to do, um, because that's the only way you'll get the, the access to do the track builder. So are you building just tracks, or is your scope a little bit broader than just playing in the dirt? Um, so one of the things that we've stolen from Macra Peak is a bit more of a holistic view. Um, if you're going to build a track, you're going to be typically destroying some bush. Um, all of the bush that we are working in is um, regenerating farmland. So typically the gorse came through and then mahoe and then you get the neighbours ultimately will, will pop up. Um, so, given that we, we are destroying bush, not a lot, but enough that gets people a little bit twitchy, you want to offset that. And I love trees. I've always loved, you know, before I got into the professional work here, I loved working with wood, and what a fantastic tool this is. Um, yes, it's a native, and we can't do that anymore, but um, it's great to see it um, rejuvenated, and looks delightful. Uh, so, yeah, planting trees. We are very fortunate with the council in, in that we get thousands of trees every year. So right now it's, it's planting season for us. <coughs> Excuse me. So our, our track work it tails off and the, the planting season has started. And we will plant track side um, initially, but we'll also uh, go through whole valleys that have got um, weeds and typically blackberry, uh, will spray, get rid of it, plant. Um, we do a lot of rubbish removal and we also do pest trees. 
So we want to create an environment that um, allows the natives to come through and not get dealt to by, um, there's a lot of uh, creepers that get into the trees and it'll collapse the canopy. Um, and we're fortunate in Wellington that there are contractors that will do that. Um, sycamores, broom, barberry, we try and just cut down and paste the stump with a, uh, a herbicide. Um, the council has been great in hosting forums around uh, weed tree identification and treatment and, um, and also the supply of, of the plants that we plant. We also get them from uh, Forest and Bird, they have a nursery in Wellington. Uh, you can apply to the, the groups like um, Project Crimson for Rata, we've planted heaps of Rata. We've purchased our own trees. We, um, we couldn't find any remo um, anywhere, so we bought our own. Um, we, we had one, I should say that uh, Brooklyn Trail Builders, there's only five of us. Okay? Um, but we're all passionate about what we do, and some of us were more passionate about plants, and some of us were more passionate about trails, and we've come together and we've created um, a group that has been activated to, to do stuff, and, and that's involved the community. So, um, when I first started in the track building, we got the local school involved. And that was in 2007. Um, yes, I had daughters at that school, and yes, I knew the, one of the teachers who was interested in the, um, the environment, and he was a mountain biker. So we got that school involved to do a, um, a tree planting day. Every year since, they've been planting trees. So in 2007, those little trees that were planted are now um, decent size, you know, two, three, four metre um, trees. So, and some of the kids have come back and and seen the trees and it's and it's quite cool that, that they're able to uh, see the product of their labours. And, and that's just one group. Um, we've used a lot of corporate volunteer labour. Um, so tap into that if you can. It might be a bit tricky in, in the Coromandel. Uh, in Wellington, we do have a lot of corporates that have a, uh, a volunteer day as part of their, um, uh, I don't know, workplace mantra. I want to get back to society. So that's been, for me, yeah, greenwashing. That's, that's, that's a fair call, yeah. Um, it, is it lip service? Well, yeah, probably is. Um, but hell, we'll just grab that labour and use it. Um, <laughs> You know, they don't necessarily do a very good job. And if you are if you are running a volunteer day, don't expect work. You are there to look after the volunteers, show them what to do, and then tell them again and again and again. And I'll, I'll digress now um, and just explain what I mean by telling people. Um, so that's your side slope. If you want to pull the track, you want to come in here. I'm quite good at doing the, the half benching sort of thing. Um, a half bench is, means you're not cutting into, if you were doing a whole bench, you'd come all the way out here and you'd have to move all of this dirt um, and then discard it down the side of the track. Sorry if you can't see that at the back. Um, I, I prefer the, uh, the half bench because it has less of an impact on the environment. You're moving less dirt. Um, a lot of people complain, or some of the council complain, that you are building up this area here and that doesn't provide a, a, as good a foundation. Over the years, I've just, you know, I'm, I'm not a scientist in soil, but it's worked for us and, it, and it's worked, we've demonstrated that it works all over the place. Um, so the, the point that I'm, I'm getting to eventually is what do people do? Human nature is a weird thing. When you, when you give them a green 
bit of or a, a, a natural slope, they want to start at the top. They always want to start up here and work down. The, the problem with that is they then bring all of the vegetative material. So all I'm trying to do is to get them to get rid of that top layer, anything that's going to rot. You want to get rid of that because if you have that underneath your track bench, it's going to retain moisture. And moisture is your, your devil incarnate in any trail. Um, and I'll come along to the um, water control later if I run out of time or not. Um, so you'll just repeat it till you're blue in the face that you want people to start at the bottom of the slope below where you want the edge of the track. So you're going to start way down here and they're going to start pulling down the vegetative material progressively. So over time you're going to build up your vegetative material below your track bench and create a hollow. Then get some of the good dirt and put in there and then stand on it. And then you progressively work your way up pulling more of this vegetative material down and down and then this material comes uh, comes in to create your, your bench. Now <laughs> Let's start again. Let's come over here. That would be how I would like a side profile of a track to look. You've got a very lazy batter. Okay? Why? The, the alternative, what a lot of people do is they'll have a vertical face here. And then it will go on to the natural. Uh, contour. If you've got a, a vertical face, several things happen. Um, to me, it, it, it clashes hugely with my eye because you don't really have a vertical face in nature. Um, other things happen, and, and ultimately over time, this is going to erode and drop material down onto the, the track bench. It will also have you have water coming down here, it will drop and um, create erosion at the, at the toe of the, the track. You'll also have, that's a really cool plant there, uh, you get vegetation growing and it'll grow into the track. So the further you can drop that vegetation edge back, the better off you are because you'll have less future maintenance. Maintenance is when we started building tracks in Wellington, they said, you build the track, we'll maintain them. Then they wised up. They said, you build the track, you maintain them. <laughs> um, and they were very wise in doing that. A, they didn't have any money at all to, to do the maintenance. Two, we build a better track now because of that maintenance obligation. So. You, you've got to be really careful around what you're building and, and making sure you're building it for the future and for reduced maintenance in the future because you really don't want to come back and revisit it time and time again, which is what we are doing right now. So you're pushing that, pushing that edge back so you've got a nice relaxed batter. It sits in the environment a lot better. You're pushing back uh, the vegetation edge. Um, if you build a vertical edge like that, you can't use this area anyway because your bike has, has handlebars and you've got a, a natural angle there on your bike um, or if you're running your, your arms, whatever. Um, so you really want to drop that edge back. Um, and I get weird about it. I rake that way so you can't see the, the strokes of where the rubber has gone because I want a really smooth edge there. Um, so avoid any straight lines, any, um, if you can introduce curves, fantastic. Um, similarly, you don't always have to have an edge like that. By the way, that's a fantastic area in the future to harvest naturally sown seedlings. The seedlings love growing in that area, so one, two, three years down the track, pluck them out and plant them down here. 
um, because they just love growing there because there's nice, there's generally water and um, because you've got this catchment area here and the birds will do their thing and drop the seeds and, and off you go. You've got your own natural nursery everywhere you breed the track. Just on that point, that is one of the really common complaints of the naysayers for building tracks is that you're creating a, a weed corridor, um, you're interrupting the flow of, of, of fauna. Um, they are correct to a point. I've never found the weed corridor one held any water whatsoever. Um, they might be they might be correct and it, it does provide a barrier for snails and whatever to get across. Um, but it's it's to me it's it's at the you know the, the slim end of the scale of reasonableness for for, for stopping um, access into the green spaces. Um, so that's sort of a, a, a reasonable side profile. Over time your track will wear and you'll get a, a compression from use, you just can't avoid it. It is going to happen over time because um, you're, you're dealing with an uncompacted product, typically because you are a volunteer and you don't have the machinery. Um, and the best way to deal with that, well there's two ways. Um, if you have access to imported gravel, and you've got the ability to pay for it, do that. So it's expensive though. The last quote we got was about 25 bucks a lineal metre to bring and lay imported gravel. It cuts your maintenance burden hugely by having a really solid base. The, the other alternative we've used is we quarry natural rock and we armour it and we just physically smack it in. We've got stompers, um, it's just a, a, a big handle with a flat plate and you just smack the, the rock into the track surface and that will provide a really good surface over time. It's still not as good as imported gravel. Some people hate it, it makes a weird noise. Ultimately though, you'll get leaf litter on it and you won't know it's there. To the point now where we have to rake those tracks to get it back to that gravel surface because the the accumulation of leaf litter over time gives the impression the track is really soft, it's not. Underneath is a solid, solid base. Um, so that's kind of a, a very quick track 101. And I started with trying to get volunteers, you're, you're dealing with them at the bottom end. If they start at the top, they cover up the track with vegetable material, it's just going to rot, it retains the water in the track surface and you're going to get puddles and holes. Um, the track will take longer to dry out, which means it's, you've got a bigger gap between when people are using the track. Um, and that just creates damage. So if you can get the water off the track, um, there's so much of it. Pardon me? The corporate volunteers would be good for carrying rocks. Yeah, they are, but they hate it. <laughs> They, love, they like doing all the, the nice stuff, um, planting trees and, and creating mayhem. They love cutting down trees. So maybe I'll drive the rest there. If you've got a, if you've got a track, um, as you know, I'll go back, I'll go back uh, to actually creating an alignment for a track. So you've got a track, um, you've, you're in your master plan, You've got a start point and a finish point. They are the most important. What happens in the middle doesn't matter so much other than you need to make sure it's feasibly possible to build a track there. So I'll go through with this. I'll rip a bit off and tie that to a tree at either. Oops. That's uh, <clears throat> this is a clonometer. And you just sight through it to the tag in the tree, you wander down the bush and you stand next to another tree and you're sighting through it, five degrees is your average, okay? If you go less than that, fine. If you go more than that, it's okay for a short distance. Don't do it for too long. 
the, the, the track will not be sustainable long term if you're going more than five degrees. Um, you know, even at eight degrees, that makes a big difference. Um, it's, it's harder to run on it, it's harder to bike up it. Um, if you're biking down it and people brake heavily, they'll skid. Um, it just doesn't work that well in the environment. What the other thing is, if, if you've got your start point, finish point, and the average is, let me get it upside down, is five degrees, you really don't want to have a track that's just a constant grind up there. Why don't you want to have a track doing that? Us blokes get numb nuts doing that. Okay? It's just so hard grinding, grinding, grinding. You want to have a track, if you're looking at a side profile, it goes up, it comes down, it comes up, it goes down. And, and use the environment to create interest in a track. Um, and, and to say that's, that's your elevation as well as from a plan view. Don't, I shouldn't say don't, but if you can avoid it, don't have straight lines. There are no straight lines in nature. Um, so that works equally from the top. So work in trees around it. Um, Hamish Seaton, one of the great New Zealand track builders. Great lesson. Every tree is worth a conversation. So the bigger the tree, the longer the conversation. Um, it's had a lot of time out there growing, and if it's a cool native, just work around it. Don't, don't take it out. Um, so anyway, along your alignment, you've got lots of tags, and the average overall is, is five degrees. Um, but when you get volunteers on the ground, unless you tell them exactly what to do, they'll just go mad with a saw, and they'll cut down everything. So after you've, after you've figured out the track is feasibly possible, then depending on your consent with the landowner, you'll go back and do a more detailed track. And if you've got volunteers coming afterwards, tie these either side of the track so you're creating a corridor. And then tell the people, don't cut down any trees that have got one of these around it. Um, so you're dealing with the stuff in between and you'll have these every four or five metres depending on what, what your ground is like. Um, if they're going to cut a tree down, get them to cut it at sort of yay high off the ground. Um, and with the foliage, take it all the way, all the way down so you can't see it on the track. Um, there's nothing worse than um, it's sort of like after the track's built, you're riding through and you've got a, a graveyard full of dead trees. So take it down through the, through the scrub or the bush or whatever you've got and hide it lower down the slope. And then with the stump that you've, you've dug out, um, oh, before you dig it out, if you leave it a, a, a decent length on it, then, you, then when the volunteers go around the base, they've got some leverage to pull the thing out with. If they cut the stump down, you're doubling the amount of time to get that stump out of the ground. And an objective I have with a, um, a grade three track is there are no roots on it. There's nothing that will cause um, a, a, a hazard for, for slipping or skidding your tire on. You really want to bury all the roots and look after the trees as well, as well as looking after the, the track, track users. So that's kind of a, um, a, a quick one on, 101 on on the sort of things to do with, with a volunteer group. You really don't get much opportunity to work if you're looking after them and trying to control um, this mass of humanity that are just going through the bush wrecking it. Um, and typically you'll have to go back and work on that. Um, so after we've had a corporate group go through and we've done this thing, we end up spending a lot of time on that edge and what we call is in search of the truth. And that's where we're, we're, we're going through removing all of the vegetative material and returning it with um, 
uh, dirt that has nothing in it that will rot because your, um, uh, the, the, the roots and the, uh, the network of um, very small roots retain moisture and it's, um, it's not going to help you, you track long term. Uh, swales, water control. Um, there's a, there's, so my job is property and the, the mantra in property is location, location, location. With, with tracks and their maintenance, the mantra should be water, 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 and how you control it. If, if you've got a, uh, a track that doesn't have an outslope, okay, so that's the, are you familiar with what I mean by an outslope? It's the downhill edge. You want to have a horizontal slope across the track so that when water lands on the track, it leaves the track as soon as it possibly can. Really, really important. Um, so your, your track bench will have one of three things. It'll have a, an outslope, which is preferred, an inslope, which is tricky, or a crown. So a crown is you, you've got a, your, your track and then it's, the water can go both ways. Um, if you've got water going to the inside of the track, at some point it needs to go across the track to um, escape and get to the downhill side. And over time, we've tried lots of different things. Um, you can have a sump with a pipe. I would use those as little as you can get away with. Uh, simply because pipes block up. Um, they'll get leaf material in them, they'll um, block and then overflow and you're, you're, you're back to where you started. Um, a swale, which is really, I'm not sure I can draw a swale. Um, it's a very shallow uh, grade reversal is another way of describing it. But you're allowed, if you're looking at a, um, I'm not even sure how I can draw it. Um, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the, a swale is where you, you're going down into a track and then the track rises. So the water cannot run along the track. If you've got water running along the direction of the track, you have failed. Because over time it's only going to get deeper and more water will flow down it and your track will erode. So, grade reversals or swales, you can't really have too many of them. So, if, if, if you've got a trail that's heading down the hill, then have them every five metres or so. Once again, you're working in with the environment, so, um, you know, you can have a trail going around a tree and have that as a dipping point. And if you've got your swale at 90 degrees, to your track, the water is going to slow down in the pond and the silt will drop out of it. Ideally your swale is at an angle so the water maintains its speed and carries the silt off the track. That's a tricky one. Um, the, the outside of the swale is going to have a lot of silt in it and once again your weeds and your plants are going to love growing there. There's really no way of avoiding every year wandering through and digging out your swales um, because otherwise the water will bank up. And unfortunately that's just one of the burdens you have to bear as being a volunteer and going through. There are some cool tools that you can use. Um, fire rakes uh, are quite good. You can rough up the surface with the, um, the raking bit and then you can flip them over and scrape out the silt material with the weeds in it. Um, some people prefer, you know, a, a decent hoe with a, a wide blade. Um, I've mentioned grubbers already. They are our weapon of choice. Um, and, but they do come in a, a variety of, of, of um, sorts. I kind of prefer, prefer the wide one. Um, they can either have a, an axe or a pick on the reverse side with a fiberglass handle. Um, I have tool stashes everywhere and I lose more tools by forgetting where I've stashed the tools than people nicking them. 
Um, so don't hide them too hard um, or mark them with some, some tape. I've done that, but typically I lose a lot because I do hide them too, too well and bugger, where do I hide those? Uh, because I run to a lot of my track uh, work spots, there's no way I can carry tools. Um, so, and you never know where you're going to be when the, the urge suddenly takes you to go and enjoy track. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I should, I've got, I've got my, I've got my phone with me all the time because I listen to, to national radio podcasts. That is really, really good for track building, I must say. <laughs> And that's another thing that really pisses you off when people want to stop and talk, you've got to turn off your podcast. So. Uh, but yeah, I could do that, you're right. It's a you know, low-tech, old brain. Uh, um, how do you maintain illegal track tools in your area? Um, they are always out there, and they're insidious. Um, the best way I've found to block an entrance is plants. Um, carpet vomit with good natives, make it obvious that the natives use a protector. Um, it's a little bit like um, street murals. You know, you don't get tagging on, on where people have invested a lot of time in creating beautiful murals on walls, whatever. They don't tend to get tagged. It's a little bit like that with where people can see fresh planting, they don't typically want to ride over young natives. Um, so that has been a, a better way. You know, council will always put up fences. It's, it's so easy to get around the fence. Um, it's really destroying the, the, the bench um, and encouraging the illegal track builders to, to come across to the light side, if you like, and, and, and become engaged with um, track building. I mentioned before we went out to consultation for 50k of track. One of the areas we set aside in that, era, in that um, 50k is, is multiple tracks in close proximity and the idea we had there was for anybody to come and build on those tracks. It wasn't really controlled by us. We were providing uh, an area where others could come and do their own thing and hopefully that would be an area um, or a, a way in which we could mitigate illegal track building. But there'll always be kids, there'll always be self-interested people, and I'm one of them as well, that want to do stuff just for them um, and muck it up for others. Um, yeah. How do you find the, the maintenance of the building of the track? When we started, we just paid for it ourselves. We've never had really a problem with money, and that might sound odd, um, the, the, you know, I've got to do a shout out for ground effect. I've always used their gear. They have a slush fund, uh, maximum of a thousand bucks for a project. I'd get in amongst it, um, apply to ground effect. That will get you uh, a set of tools that will kick you off and, and start you on a, a project. A thousand bucks doing that is marvelous. Go to your local hardware store, see if they'll give them to you at cost and um, you can leverage money from that. Um, to try and get money where you don't have a project is really hard. So you've got to do the mahi up front, get a project, get something that you can advertise, be it on Facebook or wherever. So you've actually got a, a, a project, a trick that you can work on and sell to sponsors and the, the volunteer force and the community that you've got something to work with, then it's far easier to get the money. Um, and you can go to local contractors if you're wanting uh, material. People are generally really generous. Um, so the, the entry costs to building a track are really low. You know, a, a box of that is sort of like 10 bucks. Um, you don't need a lot of money. Um, 
You don't always need one of these. You can use your eye, but it will trick you. You can think you're working on, you've, you've got a flat track and you haven't. Um, so these are really good at creating the trail. And I'll, I'll re-emphasize the, the alignment of the trail. You can't spend too much time planning a trail. You really, really can't. Um, for one track I did in Wellington, it's called Clinical, and I'll come back to that name later. Um, it was an incredibly challenging terrain. It was very steep. There were lots of, um, I won't say bluffs, but places where you couldn't realistically build a track uh, without some heavy engineering. Um, but I did find a route through, and that was what was used in the consultation document. The track today is nothing like that route. Um, it ended up being way longer for that reason with the, the dips. Um, it ended up going to far more interesting places. It, it crossed a couple of streams that it was not ever meant to cross. Um, and that in itself created a real challenge because I somehow had to create a, a radius, a turning radius, and I couldn't do that on one side of the stream. So I had to cross the stream twice to get the diameter or the radius to, to make the turn. But it's created beautiful little um, areas and streams uh, to have the track turn around and then head off. And it got far better um, viewing points. We created a, um, a local artist. And I think here in the Coromandel, you've got more than your fair share per capita of artists created a really funky seat out of a, um, uh, a native fuchsia, Kotukutuku. Um, and it's a lovely feature seat that's got a view of the harbour. Um, what I did find is I found an awful lot of places where I couldn't build a track. So through um, whoops, taking these off the trees, so don't tie a really big knot in it when you tie it to a tree because the chances are you're going to have to untie it again because you didn't get it right. Um, so I moved these around for a long time, for months, until I got an alignment that I was happy with and um, it worked. So I can only stress, invest the time up front in your alignment and it will pay dividends. Um, for one of these, I don't know, I bought it years ago. Um, any um, surveying, land surveying website, you should be able to find them. So just Google clinometer. Um, and okay. and sorry, this, this is uh, from land surveyors. So it's about 10 bucks for a, for a box. Am I running out of time, Mitch? Oh, well, I was wondering whether we should just use the next sort of five, 10 minutes for some questions. Okay. okay. Just the group have got some questions to try. Craig, have you had any instances of working on council land going past private properties that haven't before had people going near them? Yes, a lot. And how have you got around that? It's tricky. Um, first of all, we've had boundaries that have come really close to all the road tracks. And sometimes that, that forces you to build uh, a steep pitch to get around it because really um, surveyors historically have done weird stuff with where they've put boundaries and you want to have a, at least a metre margin to see the back boundary. Um, do not underestimate nimbyism. Nimbyism is a really, really powerful tool. Um, you have self-interested people protecting their patch, um, arguably against the societal good. Um, in Wellington, we live next to a public walkway that accesses the ground, the, the green belt. I think it's great. Weirdly, others don't. They, they don't want people passing near. Um, so we've got a track right now where um, it's a walking only track and the, 
the person who is objecting is a mountain biker who's been using our track network for years. He loves it. He's um, donated time and uh, product to it, but he's still complaining to the council about a track being just off their back boundary. So um, I have talked to him and said, look, it's not even going to change. The council have consented it. You purchased the property after the consent had been issued for it. Use your sway to get a decent barrier there. And we can drop the track so the walkers aren't visible, touch wood. You'll hear them. Um, so, yeah, there's no easy answer. Um, it's, it's just human nature that people will complain if they don't think there is a benefit in it for them. Um, another sort of related ins instance is there is a zip line proposed for um, dump land, weirdly, in, in Wellington. And um, the, the group that were organising the zip line, um, the, one of the directors gave us our first donation decades ago uh, and it was through those relationships and they asked us if we could support their zipline. It ended up going to the Environment Court and um, I was meant to speak at the Environment Court. Unfortunately the people opposing it were my good mates. Um, so I couldn't really do that but I got one of the other Brooklyn Trail builders to, um, to appear instead. And it is really tricky because you have people with vested interests in their land and they don't want others, even though it's a, even though you have a rule book that's written by the council encouraging recreation in those spaces, it's, it's a challenge. And, and I would think talking to the people sooner rather than later, please avoid going to the environment court, it doesn't work. Um, the costs were hundreds of thousands of dollars in that. Any other questions? Yeah, what about EB consultation? Yeah, you were working on council uh, it's a good one. Um, track naming um, is quite a interesting one now. With um, uh, you know, typically a lot of trails have been built by males, and they want to name tracks in weird, sexist, inappropriate ways. And that shouldn't happen. It should have, it should have some meaning with um, the the local area. It could be historical. It could be cultural. Um, we had a meeting with the the local iwi hapu. Oh, maybe um, it was within the last year. And I asked a question. You know, would, would you call us the kaitiaki of the land? And he said, no way, you guys aren't. No, you can't, you can't claim that. That's not, that's not for you to give to yourself as a name. You can call yourself manaki, which is, a, which is an entirely different thing. Um, and, you know, uh, manaki whenua. So we were at that meeting, so Brooklyn Trail was, was there with Polar Protectors, which is a, a group that used our network for traffic. So they've got a, a track every um, 50 metres along our network to um, eradicate um, you know, weasel stokes, possums, rats, mice. Um, and the bird life, it's in the Halo area next to Zealandia, is impressive. Very impressive. So if you're in Wellington, um, sing out, I'll take you for a bit of a tiki talk, and um, the bird life is quite aggressive. So yes, daily consultation, don't underestimate it. Um, they can be a, an active partner, um, and I, you know, I, I certainly know of instances where um, it hasn't worked with iwi. Land, in a cultural sense, has quite a different connotation um, than in a um, a European sense, you know, it can be owned and sliced and diced. That's not necessarily the, the, the same with, um, with, with Māori iwi. Um, they have far more, um, well, it's a, it's more of a cultural link and it's, 
an esoteric thing rather than an asset thing that um, I might I might think of it. So uh, if you can if you can use uh, cultural names, um, our late, our most recent track has a Japanese name, Vicky Guy. Um, look it up. That, that's why we build tracks. If you um, Google Vicky Guy, you'll see why um, we do what we do. Um, it doesn't just need to be Maori. It can be, you know, multicultural. So, uh, anything else? We might, um, we might break from one and two now. Craig, uh, and Craig's going to be here all day, and so obviously taking questions for our day. So thanks, Craig, very much.